Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 36th annual Vancouver International Film Festival and our third annual VIF Industry Exchange. My name is Jacqueline Dupuis, and I'm the Executive Director of the VIF Society. We are honored to have the opportunity to host today's fireside chat, Creative Canada, a vision for Vancouver. For Vancouver, well, Vancouver too. <laughs> Canada's Creative Industries with Honorable Melanie Jolie, Minister of Canadian Heritage. Ladies. It's very fitting that Minister Jolie is here today during VIP Industry Exchange, which aims to educate and inspire the growth of screen based creators and companies in the digital space. It was the foresight of lo local partners such as Creative BC and the Canadian Media Producers Association to support programs like these that drive the continued innovation and strengthening of BC's creative industries. I know that this is a priority for Minister Shirley across the country and across sectors, and today she will talk about the Government of Canada's vision for cultural and creative industries in the digital world. Minister Jolie has been a passionate supporter of arts throughout her career, and her current responsibilities include the oversight of Canada's arts and culture policies and organizations, a dynamic creative sector that extends across music, film, television, broadcasting, digital, and new media. Her mandate also includes promotion of Canada's two official languages, preservation of Indigenous languages and culture, and government policies on multiculturalism. Her vision is rooted in the belief that arts and, culture, arts and culture are an essential part of any innovation and economic development agenda, and we couldn't agree more. Welcome, Minister Jolie. Thank you. Our moderator for today's session is Emily Molnar, the Artistic Director of Ballet BC. Emily is a pillar in Vancouver's arts and cultural se sector whose vision has steered the unique company of 20 dancers into a celebrated era of innovation that now includes more than 40 works by celebrated Canadian and international choreographers. She's been awarded the Globe and Mail's Dance Artist of the Year, Vancouver Mayor's Arts Award, and the YWCA Women of Distinction Award. She was also appointed to the Order of Canada for her artistic leadership of Ballet BC and its creative contribution to advancing dance in Canada. Emily was recently a member of the expert advisory group to Minister Jolie for Canadian content in a digital world. Welcome, Emily. <laughs> Today's discussion will last for about 45 minutes with time for questions from the audience. Welcome, Minister Jolie and Emily. I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. And welcome everyone to this fireside chat with our guest, the Honorable Melanie Jolie. Thank, Thank you. you. How are you? Very good. Very good. How are you? <laughs> Great to see you. Great Lovely to be in Vancouver. Yes, I was saying to the minister that we organized some good weather for her. So yeah. was, well, thank you. <laughs> we're very lucky to have you. Thank you all for coming. It's such an important conversation and it's such a pleasure to be able to have this moment with the minister in a more intimate setting. Um, minister, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We know your schedule is incredibly busy. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing a little bit more about your vision for the future of our creative industries. So just before we start, I just want to let the audience know that we'd love to have you tweet and please use hashtag Creative Canada. We'd love to have your comments online. So Minister, um, first of all, thank you for the work that you, your team, the office is doing. Uh, you've had quite a big year. You've uh, traveled the country consulting with many creators and creative industries. Uh, you've coordinated Canada 150 celebrations coast to coast to coast. You've been super busy with that. Not to mention the work that you've done in the Indigenous languages, uh, legislation, official languages, and as well multiculturalism. Could you share some of the highlights with us mm -hmm. over the past year? Um, yeah, it's been pretty busy yes. indeed. Um, do you sleep? Uh, I do, <laughs> and well. <laughs> um, so. Last time I was in Vancouver was actually um, when we launched, in the context of Canon 150, there were four celebrations that were really important. Uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day, um, making sure we could celebrate uh, Francophonie Day, um, also Multiculturalism Day, which is June 27th, and I was here to celebrate Multiculturalism Day, and it was a fantastic day. And during that trip also, I launched the, um, actually I um, announced uh, the funding for 312 Main Street. 
which is an amazing creative hub here in downtown Eastside. So um, it's been a it's it's been a pleasure to come and and to visit uh, and to discover Vancouver and its production uh, studios and also its uh, great post production studios. Um, so yes, it's been a big year. Um, it's been a big year because of Yes Canada 150, because of the consultations, but also because in Budget 2016 we reinvested 1.9 billion dollars in arts and culture, and we uh, throughout the year we saw that happening, trickling down bit by bit. So 550 million to the Canada Council. We're doubling the budget of the Canada Council. We'll have a bigger can, uh, council for the arts than the UK, and we're 35 million. Uh, they're you know nearly twice as much. Um, so yes, being in, in the ballet sector, of course, um, you know we just gave 675 million to CDC, uh, 22 million to Telefilm, and also money to the NFB. So just. It's one thing to announce these funds, it's another thing that people feel it on the ground and more and more we're seeing that people are feeling it. Also in context, context of Canada 150, well, um, there's three main parts to our social contract. The first one is our official languages and uh, so we're working on a plan which is to uh, increase bilingualism across the country but also uh, making sure that we can support uh, francophones outside Quebec and anglophones in Quebec. Um, second pillar, that second component to that social contract is, is the importance of pluralism. So I've talked about Multiculturalism Day uh, on June 27th, which we celebrated in context of Canada 150, but it's more than that. It's making sure that diversity and, and inclusion is embedded in everything we do. And uh, third is the importance of reconciliation. And I've been working a lot with national organizations, national indigenous organizations, to co-develop together a first legislation, so that's a first in itself, uh, but also a first legislation on indigenous languages. And we hope we'll be able to uh, present a first uh, draft of a bill in uh, 2018. So I'm working very hard with uh, the uh, Indigenous, Métis, and Inuit uh, organizations. Um, but it's funny to be the heritage minister and inherit a system that is actually not necessarily in line with how people consume information and, and content, and that has been the main focus also of, of our policy work at Heritage for the last year. This which leads into this next question that I have. It's, it's been a year since you launched your consultations with on Canadian content in a digital world, yeah. right? And a week ago, you announced Creative Canada, which is the federal government's new policy for going, growing Canada's creative industries. Some of us in the room were able to follow it online, and some of us heard about it in the media. Can you just, for those of us in the room right now, give us a little bit of a short description or a brief, of an elevator yeah. pitch of what that uh, vision is for Creative? Well, actually, the sector accounts for 630,000 jobs. And it doesn't even include uh, the, the jobs that are in the video game sector, or all the great artistic jobs that we know that are also in post production. So it's even a bigger sector than what I'm describing you it is. And it's uh, worth pretty much $55 billion. And it's growing and growing. And other countries' sectors uh, also growing. But Canada is a leader in a creative industry. So it's our first creative industry strategy in our history. And what we want, um, and we, because of what we heard, is that um, Canada become really a leader in terms of the quality of the content that is created here. And that can be shown and discovered here in Canada, but also abroad. So uh, it, it really includes the fact that we need to protect our culture, we need to promote our sector, and we need to make sure we have also uh, uh, good recognition here at home by Canadians, but also across the world. And also on much more the international leadership side, um, Canada, we need to be a pioneer in making sure that there's a space online for national content and Canadian voices, making sure that we have our space while we know that there are great players developing great content. 
And so uh, that's in line with the importance of cultural diversity, which is really a principle that is important to Canadians and that has been recognized for 80 years when developing our own cultural policy. The, the need to make sure we have our space while we know that south of the border is the biggest creator of content in the world. Um, so we've developed an entire vision around three pillars. The first one is really making sure that we invest in our creators, invest in their stories, invest in the beginning of the process, rather than intermediaries, rather than supporting necessarily only the fact of showing it or distributing it. It's really making sure that we're there when people create and that we're enticing that and that we can protect that. Second is, the second pillar is making sure we uh, support the discovery and distribution of content here and around the world. And third is uh, supporting local news and strengthening our public broadcasters and making sure that we are, have a CBC that is even stronger than it is right now. So that's the entire um, vision and pretty much framework and roadmap for our sector. And part of that is revealing the copyright to the broadcast. I'm getting there. Oh, there, there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said that this is the first economic strategy yep. uh, for creative industries. And what we've heard is that it addresses some concerns. Yeah. Um, but some would argue that some stories. What we did, the first thing we did is we heard the anxiety in, in the sector about the fact that production uh, funding could go down because actually it was also the broadcasters were <coughs> participating to the CMF, the Canada Media Fund. And since their revenues are declining, well, actually the CMF uh, funding was declining. Well, as a government, we decided to step up and create a backstop. And for the next few years, we'll make sure that the funding doesn't go down. So that's a big part of supporting more producers, but also helping our broadcasters that are going through transition because they'll have access to work that is funded not necessarily through uh, you know, as much as they used to by their own way. Um, what we heard also is usually we only fund production um, projects. We don't fund script development. And we know that the IP is there, is in script development. And we know we have to become stronger in that to make sure we have, we value our, our intellectual property. So now the CMF will be supporting script development. We also heard that CAFCO, which is the body, that the agency that is within Heritage that deals with tax credits, is too complicated, has too much red tape, and, and we want to change that. So we'll create a one-stop shop with Telefin and CAFCO for the administration of tax credits. And also, um, we know that there needs to be more fairness to creators. We need to change the rules of the game when it comes to copyright. And we'll be reviewing the Copyright Act to make sure that we can support better creators and really value their IP. Um, we also will work to reform the Copyright Board to make sure that uh, artists are paid much more quickly because right now tariffs are being administrated in, you know, and the backlog is, is very important. So this is for the production first pillar. Second is um, how can we, you know, when you look at the market, how it works, is we see it as how can we deal with our own domestic market? <coughs> Second thing is how can we deal with foreign platforms coming into our domestic market? And third is, how can we make sure that our domestic market goes to international markets? And so for international, for, for our own domestic market, as I said at the beginning, I inherited a system that is not in at pace with the disruption happening. The Broadcasting Act was last 
uh, you know, amended in 1991. I don't know how old some of you were in this room in 1991, but that was before the internet. So there's nothing in the legislation we have that recognize the importance of dealing with our space online. And so we will uh, be modernizing the Broadcasting Act and the Telecommunications Act uh, to make sure that we can protect our culture. And also, uh, we've asked the CRTC, under Section 15 of the CRTC Act, to come back with a report to uh, about who are the new players in the systems in the system, and what are the new business models? Because we the we need the um, we need the um, expertise of the CRTC to study that question and bring us back solutions. And once we have that, and once also we, we will be working, I'll be announcing in the fall how we will go ahead in this modernization that is actually at the backbone of our entire communication system in the country. And when reforming these, um, these acts, uh, of course we believe in a principle that is called net neutrality, which is important, that is to treat all data equal online but we believe also in the importance of the principle of cultural diversity in making sure we have a space online for content. Now, um, that's for our own domestic market. How to deal with foreign platforms coming in our domestic market? Well, actually, we are, um, we've had discussions with different platforms because we think that they, um, uh, can be good partners and you know, to uh, ultimately participate in making sure that Canadians hear about Canadian voices, but also the world hears about Canadian voices. And that's why um, there's been investment that, that has been authorized uh, f from Netflix in, uh, in investing in original Canadian uh, content. And I'll be talking about that afterwards. And third, uh, we'll be also investing in making sure that our own creators are strong abroad. And so we uh, launch our first cultural export strategy. We now have more uh, uh, cultural trade uh, commissioners that are now that have boots on the ground that are also cultural diplomats, helping our missions, helping our embassies. Uh, to develop local markets. And uh, we are also much more present in international fairs. For example, we'll be doing the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the biggest fair in the world uh, in 2020. We just did the uh, Gamescon Cologne um, uh, video games fair in Germany. And so, and we're Canada with the, uh, the, the guest of honor. So we want to be much more present there because we know that that's where relations are, uh, are, relationships are built and that deals are made. And finally, about local, con local news, of course we want to support more uh, local uh, information. Uh, well, we know that there's disruption in the media sector, but uh, also we want to strengthen uh, the mandate of the CBC. The mandate of the CBC is in the Broadcasting Act, since we're opening the Broadcasting Act. We want to make sure that CBC plays a role of supporting you guys in the room, supporting Canadian production, making sure it's 100% Canadian, and that it becomes the platform uh, to show great content, uh, cultural content, news information from here uh, and across the country in both official languages. You've brought up Netflix, which um, I know a lot of people in the room will want to probably talk about. We know that there's been quite a bit of chatter and questions around the Netflix deal. Could you just take a few minutes here in this intimate environment to kind of set the record a little bit straight for us? Just what it, what does it mean for all of us in Canada, for all Canadians? So um, when we first started discussions with Netflix, uh, Netflix uh, mentioned that they wanted to invest in Canada uh, to uh, support Canadian talents. Um, and um, they decided to do so by opening a first Canadian production house 
in the country, the first outside the US. Now, under the Canada Investment Act, I, as minister, have to approve an investment that is <coughs> coming from a foreign company. And so the Canada Production House of Netflix being foreign controlled is still basically needs to be approved. And the approval is based on the fact that it is a net benefit to Canadians. So it's a net benefit to Canadian writers, producers, filmmakers. And so it's a deal which uh, actually uh, sets $500 million of investment over five years. Um, and uh, it is to support Canadian orig original Canadian productions. And it is, has nothing to do with the fact that uh, actually they will pay the, their uh, tax income here. Uh, there's no there, there's no tax exemption, uh, and uh, of course, um, there this is the first time in the world that they're investing so much in opening in this production house, and it's really building on the fact that they've done great co-productions here. Made the Anna Green Gables, which is a co-production with CBC, which CBC holds the rights here, but Netflix distributes internationally and. Uh, same for Elias Grace. Same with uh, you know uh, um, Frontier uh, on Discovery Channel. So um, I think it's it's great news because it really will help scale up um, s production uh, budgets, which is so difficult to do only within our own market. And you had mentioned. Uh, that there is a review process as well? But exactly. So every year, the my department um, monitors uh, the investment. And should they not follow the conditions, therefore, there's retaliatory, you know, there's um, enforceable clauses. Um, how will the policy address some of the specific issues and concerns that I know that you've probably um, heard during some consultations here at BC and with some of our film industry that are, that are here today? Yeah, um, so on the indigenous issue, for example, which we heard a lot here, um, we know we have to bring the indigenous perspective in everything we do. And that's exactly what the Canada Council is doing right now. And that's why also the NFP, Telefilm, CBC, uh, and many private partners have uh, worked on uh, creating the first indigenous screen office to develop uh, much more um, some, some um, capacities uh, for indigenous creators and indigenous uh, screenwriters and, and, and producers. So that's one thing we heard. Also, um, for Telefilm, um, we heard that there's a need for more co-productions. And in the audiovisual uh, sector, of course, it's a, a co-production treaties between two uh, countries. So what I've decided to do is modernize many co-production treaties. Um, and we just finished modernizing the co-production treaty with Ireland. We signed a first co-production treaty for a film with China. We signed one with on that point, um, I understand you have some great news that you wanted to share with us today. <laughs> Something that you hinted at when talking about export yeah. and discovery of our excellent homegrown content. Yeah. So I think we're all looking forward to hearing yeah. what you might have to share. So um, we developed the first cultural export strategy. And um, we have an intent of uh, making sure we have our first creative industries uh, trade mission that would be launched in the spring of 2018, so this coming spring, to China. Um, last January, I went to China, met with the Minister of Culture. Uh, we uh, eventually signed an agreement to further collaboration. Um, and uh, I really want to make sure that we um, actually are seizing the great opportunities that are happening in the Chinese market. Because China is now, of course, um, uh, its, its middle class has um, much more um, uh, means uh, to, to spend on content and increasing demand 
over content. And the Minister of Culture of China confirmed me that the, the percentage of GDP in the creative sector uh, is, uh, it is the objective of the government of China to grow it from 4% to 5%. So imagine 1% of the GDP of China. And uh, that creates a lot of opportunities. There's one new museum per day that is being opened in China. There's 38 great facilities, uh, performance hall halls that are in China. And so we want to bring our creators there, knowing very much that quite well that, that government support really helps open doors in China. Um, and we already have an expert advisory committee in Shanghai. We've been working with uh, Wenlun Alps and his team at the Shanghai Mission to make sure that we can really have uh, strong capacity on the field. Um, and that's why in the spring, we want to um, bring uh, a lot of uh, great creative minds to China. Uh, we've identified four fields that are really important. The importance of uh, film and audiovisual in general. The importance of um, video games and virtual reality. And the importance also of the sector, museum sector and design. And finally, performing arts. So if you're interested in participating in this uh, you know, first mission, Please go on our website, please contact my team, um, because the idea is to have great creative talent and develop new markets in that country. It's very exciting news. We're lucky to be the first to hear about it. Um, I think just we're going to start to open up the, the platform a little bit for some questions. Um, just the minister has only a few more minutes that she can stay with us, so we just ask to be concise, but then we'll try to get to as many people as possible. I believe that there's going to be microphones on both ends. Um, so please feel free to come up and ask any questions. And don't be shy. Mm -hmm. yeah. hey, um, what you've been saying in terms of protecting a space for our culture is music to my ears, I'm sure everybody here. So thanks to you and your colleagues for bringing us out of the dark ages. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, in that spirit, um, I've had a film that's just uh, is playing theatrically. And I'm finding that the theatrical space, our screens, is shrinking. And I want to know um, what the what's on your plan, what's your strategy, to make sure that our theatrical screenings are part of a continuum of our film and not seen as a sunset technology, and particularly outside of the big six cities. I'm seeing that it's virtually impossible for Canadian film to get onto Canadian theatrical screens. Yeah. And of course, theatrical screens are really important, especially in places, well, of course, in big urban centers, and, and, uh, but especially in places where we know broadband coverage is not as, as good. And you know, when thinking of our policy, that's the other big um, challenge we have, is we know that places like Vancouver, or my hometown, Montreal, and Toronto, for example, have great broadband coverage, but it's really not the case everywhere in the country. And this, you know, the cost of internet is really, really high in, in our country, one of the highest in the world. Um, so that's why we have to take into account that. Um, of course, in terms of the theatrical screens and funding, and um, this is much more telefilm that we'll be working on this issue. We've provided with a vision, and now all of portfolio agencies, so there's 18 under, well, 17 under Heritage, will be now adapting their programs to that. Um, what we uh, usually deal more at, at Heritage per se, is music and literature. Film is an independent agency, is telefilm. Uh, um, everything in line with television is much more the Canada Media Fund, which is independent from us. And so the list goes on. But I'm convinced Carl Brabant, which is the CEO of Telefilm, uh, is know the importance of theatrical screens and we'll bear that in mind in making sure that that transition is not too difficult in the sector. In regards to uh, Netflix, what's the timeline on the production house and the five-year plan? 
Well, the agreement was, uh, well, the investment was authorized last week. So um, they now have five years and, uh, you know, a hundred million dollars to spend per year. So, well, the timeline is now. <laughs> Another question? <clears throat> From the cheat sheet. From the, we've got one down here and then we'll just go right up there. How about that? Okay. Sir? You want me to shoot? I guess I got a, a loud voice. Um, uh, in advocating for a new Vart Vancouver Art Gallery, a leader in the city's visual arts community uh, said to me, that uh, it's been 50 years since ground was broken on a major new cultural facility in downtown Vancouver. And he's not wrong. Uh, that project aside, um, I'm wondering if you have, if you have any long-term plans in that regard, um, and whether or not a situation like that would wash in Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, first of all, when uh, we were first appointed, one of the first thing I decided to do was to become close friends with the Minister of Infrastructure and to ultimately make sure that, the, that there could be uh, funding secured for cultural spaces. And so what we did is we increased the funding at the cultural, uh, Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, which is under Heritage, which is for projects that are below $15 million. And so, for example, 312 Main Street is an example of what we just supported. But for bigger projects, actually, this is a decision that must be taken by the, the, the province and the municipality. What I've done, though, is my, my uh, colleague, Amarjit Sowi, Minister of Infrastructure, and I, decided to agree that we could now fund this back. <laughs> uh, great music. It's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, so uh, what what we agreed on is that cultural spaces, cultural infrastructure could now be part of agreements with provinces. Under the past government that was not the case. So infrastructure such as roads and bridges and uh, I don't know, sewers could be <laughs> funded by the federal government, but no cultural spaces. And that shocked me. And so we changed that. And so basically, if the province and the, and the city agree, you know, we, uh, we can work with them. But they need to put that in the priorities of their list of funding uh, of infrastructure they want us to buy. We have one up there in the back. Hi there. Yeah. Um, I too wanted to say thank you uh, for all your hard work and I'm very, I'm up here. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry we don't have the microphone. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, I was saying I wanted to thank you as well for all your hard work on, on this. I'm really excited to see the details of your export and, and discovery uh, strategy. I wondered if you, regarding the Netflix announcement, I wonder if you could help um, define what original Canadian production really means and mm -hmm. whether or not that's Netflix investing in productions that will, that like the, some of the, C, the CBC example you mentioned, where they retain the back end, or whether or not it's an opportunity for Canadian producers to to create products where they'll be sharing at least in those international, you know, yeah. the international distribution. So original Canadian uh, content, well, production means um, that it can't be already commercially shown in Canada. So for example, if a film, is presented at VIF or at TIFF uh, and has not been bought, then that's the Canadian original production. Uh, if also uh, there is a co-production with, for example, CBC or, or uh, CTV, that's also the case. Um, and it's, it's a bit broader than CanCon, per se, because for example, Netflix did a Netflix original, which is called Arc, which is a Canadian writer, actually it's shot in Canada, Canadian writer, Canadian uh, filmmaker, Canadian actor, um, and also um, Canadian uh, director of photography, but it's not CanCon per se. So um, we've provided a bit of flexibility because we knew that 
What was mostly important for our producers here was to scale up budgets to make sure that content could be of even a greater quality. And so it's really to the benefit of the writers and the directors and the producers. And it, it is not only service production, for example. I hope I answered your question. We have time for two more, so this, this gentleman will get back up to you. Hi there. Um, question about regional equity as far as you know things like Netflix. Uh, 500 million. I think that everything is shot in Vancouver. <laughs> um, but so there's two things. Um, I think first, Vancouver should be extremely proud of its sector in terms of Canadian production and, and film industry and, and, and post production. Because I came back from LA, what, in May? Everybody was talking to me about Hollywood North, which was here. And, um, and how much there was great talent and, and expansion projects on the part of many, many studios there for here. Um, but that's um, for post-production and that's for you know infrastructure. Uh, now we have an investor that decided to actually um, invest in our stories. And uh, it's not regionally based and it's not the government decided where to invest. It's actually the investor that will decide which story it will invest in. And the reality is right now is that there's a global hunt for stories. The best stories will be developed. And so um, the idea, of course, is for the investor to organize pitch days and meet Canadian producers. As for funding and regional, the regional perspective in general, what I realize as Canadian Heritage Minister, and of course as uh, uh, you know Montrealer, the regional um, distribution of funding is also um, dependent sometimes on the fact that provinces invest or not in culture. And where provinces invest less, usually there's less, you know, uh, development of talent because there's not only the province that invests, but also the federal government or the municipality. And what I'm seeing in BC is actually a big shift, and a potential big shift also with the new government of actually recognizing the importance of arts and culture. And I think that will help in order to make sure that there's great support uh, on the part of the federal government also. So I hope I answered your question. We have one last question up there in the balcony, and then we'll have to close. I know everyone just keeps talking about Netflix, and I think your announcements actually uh, are all going to be about the details, right? There's so much you're tackling. So I look forward to seeing all those details, export, copyright, etc. cetera. Um, right now, our system for independent producers and creators is predicated on us retaining ownership of copyright. That's what triggers the tax credits. That's how we access telephone. So I think the big question for everyone directly is, in the Netflix model, will Canadian creators retain copyright? Because mm -hmm. currently they don't. Mm -hmm. If you work with Netflix right now, their deal is they buy it from you, you're paid a 5% producer fee and a 15% premium, and then they own it. So I think that's really the big question all of us mm -hmm. want to know, mm -hmm. is what was the conversation about copyright? Because it's related to everything else in your announcement. Will we own it or will they? Yeah. Well, it depends what's the uh, agreement uh, with the different producers. So it's a negotiated agreement. If, for example, the work has already been done and is presented in a festival, that's one thing. The copyright is the one that is by the producer itself. If it's an, an original or a co-production, then it's a question of negotiation. But that's why we've been very much in, interested in how can we have a stronger copyright approach for our creators? Um, how can we ultimately invest at the core of their ideas to make sure then they're more protected? Should act actually their work be developed on, in a book, on a screen, etc. And so 
The Copyright Act is revised usually every five years, and we are launching the review this fall. But I want to make sure that there's more awareness to creators, because I'm seeing that in AV, but I'm really seeing that in music a lot. And ultimately, it's how do we deal with copyright on platforms, on international platforms? And that's a difficult question. That's a question that actually a lot of countries are asking themselves. And there's been this entire vision of the internet whereby it's based on uh, the free movement of, of content and access to great knowledge, but there's not a lot of, there's never been a discussion on what's the social contract on the internet? Who is benefiting from the work? How can we make sure we empower our creators? And uh, that's a conversation I started having at the G7 Minister of Culture Summit, at the World Economic Forum, at, uh, also at UNESCO. But that's what I want to continue to have with the Silicon Valley players, at the international, different international forums. But meanwhile, we will be the first in the world to, to really tackle this issue with our legislation, changing our legislation. Broadcasting Act, Telecoms Act, and Copyright Act together. And that's why it's a big, big challenge. I need your help to go through it. Because I'm doing it for you guys, actually. Minister, thank you so much for taking this time. Thank thanks, Director Horn, for being here this afternoon. Again, thanks to the Minister, and thanks for, to you, Emily, for